Good morning, PSW staff, clients, and friends joining us. Hey now, welcome to Tuesday's class. Yesterday was the film scoring assignment for um, A Beautiful Mind, and uh, we're going to do a good job with that, I'm, I'm sensing. So get the, the pieces into me today, and we'll see the, the beautiful results on Friday. You guys are getting better and better and better. Um, today's going to be uh, tough but fun. Um, we're we're going to tackle a Russian composer, maybe the most important Russian composer that was born just right before the 20th century started. And um, I don't know if I've talked about his name, but I guarantee you, you know a few of his pieces. Um, when you talk about genius, gosh, I mean, uh, reading this, you know, researching this class, it just makes me feel so inadequate, like I've done nothing. I mean, this guy was such a monumental force of music in 20th century and influenced, I mean, just film composers. I mean, John Williams will openly say that he owes so much of his influence to this giant Russian genius. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Sergei Prokofiev. So this guy completed seven operas, seven symphonies, eight ballets, five piano concertos, two violin concertos, a cello concerto, a symphony concerto for cello and orchestra, and nine completed piano sonatas, uh, all within 61 years. He died when he was 61 in, in 1953, the same exact day Stalin died, which was, which took away a lot of the focus because, you know, this was all in Russia. And... You know, of course, Stalin was huge, and I think it interrupted with a lot of the funeral plans that uh, Prokofiev's uh, wife and family had. But um, written all that music, because uh, he started at a young age. Uh, his mom played piano, Chopin and Beethoven for him when he was very young, and by um, five, he wrote his first composition. Um, and then by nine, he wrote his first opera, The Giant. Uh, so... Child prodigy, to say the least, and, and a, supposedly a brilliant chess player, too. So um, I'm so intimidated by this guy already. It's just, uh, and uh, I think he was quite an intellect and, and a little bit arrogant. But uh, again, you know, I say when you're arrogant, that's that's not the best quality. But if you have the talent to back it up, it's, um, it's excusable, maybe. So born in uh, 1891 big thing happens in 1891 we get Carnegie Hall now if you you don't know the name it's not Carnegie Deli that's a different place that's where they have great sandwiches but it's in New York Carnegie Hall is um, on 7th Avenue right in Midtown Manhattan and um, it's uh, I've been there a few times it's a wonderful place to hear uh, classical music so that's built the year Prokofiev is born um, the joke is, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is to practice. Uh, if once you've performed there, you know that you've made it in, in some ways and it's still thriving. So as a teenager, he goes to the St. Petersburg Conservatory um, at the age of 13. So he's already a prodigy and studying classical music and piano and conducting. But he's an, a brilliant pianist already. Um, and... Uh, He's most known, and this is this is the music we're gonna we're gonna have fun with today. He's most known for uh, Peter and the Wolf, which we'll listen to, which you guys have probably probably heard of, and I played in class one time, um, which is kind of he wrote for you know for his kids and for kids in general. It's an education educational piece where um, uh, he wrote it in four days. That's it, and uh, it was a favor to the Moscow Children's Music musical theater and uh he um he said you know pay me however much you can afford so i don't know how much that was but uh you have a narrator and that narrator explains each instrument in the orchestra and apart from it being kind of a simple uh, sounding simple like a simple exercise it's actually wonderful beautiful music um so fun. I mean, I think kind of every kid had that record growing up, and there's many famous people that have narrated it, and there's also versions where you know, there's no narration, it's just lovely music. The a very cool, groovy organ jazz uh, 
composer did a whole Peter and the Wolf jazz album, and Oliver Nelson, who we talked about, did a, a an arrangement of that album, which um, is very cool. So Peter and the Wolf, Peter and the Wolf is 1936. So this is so in 1917 he leaves. He goes to the United States. He goes to Chicago, New York, you know, to get out of what the war is going on. Um, and then in 1921 comes up with a very famous piece that's super fun very march like his his music is dissonant but he loved melody but um it's 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 modern music that's what he kind of described his music as you know you have the romantic period the end of the 1800s tchaikovsky and all that stuff and then you get some atonal stuff with schoenberg and then stravinsky is in there but prokofiev's doing his own kind of mixture of of um atonality and also melody and heavy orchestration so when in Chicago he premieres in 1921 this opera that um, got kind of mixed reviews, but it went on to be to be performed all the time. And it's uh, uh, this is the march from the love for three oranges. A lot of people didn't like this. They were confused. Uh, it was su slightly surreal. Again, this is in the 20s. Surrealism was was happening with um, Eric Satie and all those other people we that you guys know about, of course. But um, Ben Heck, who wrote, uh, was one of the most famous screenwriters in in Hollywood and super great guy. He, he said, "There's nothing difficult about this music, unless you are unfortunate enough to be a music critic." So. Um, I thought that was kind of funny, you know, it, 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 it works out well if you're just a listener, but if you're a music critic, you're going to have some problems with it. And I don't know what those problems are going to be like, but they're your problems. So, uh, that was funny. That was funny. I mean, it, it's such a fun, humorous piece. So again, with composers, we've talked about humor in pieces, Rossini, Stravinsky, you know, they make you laugh, even though there's no lyrics. Um, Prokofiev had a lot of humor in his pieces. Um, and theatrical um, March-like stuff, which be, because of that, Eisenstein, the, the great film director who we'll talk about, um, asked him to do a film score because, you know, this is in the 30s, you know, as we know, films are alive and well there. Um, and uh, he asked him to do Al Alexander Nevsky. And, and he com this is some of Prokofiev Prokofiev's most brilliant and dramatic music. And he later adapted it into a score for a larger cantata but um it's performed a lot um and then uh if we go back to uh he goes back to europe because you know that's his home and so after writing peter and the wolf in 1936 he goes on to to the the one of his most famous pieces a ballet even though he liked operas more he considered himself that's what that was what he wanted to do was opera instead he did the very famous ballet to romeo and juliet Romeo and Juliet has one of the greatest pieces ever written, uh, not even of the 20th century, but the piece Dance of the Nights is terrifyingly um, beautiful.
it's just so badass like how it makes you want to dance it, it it's so theatrical it's so i mean it's it's just um you know it's like a you can do a masquerade you can just do it's such great um dramatic party music it reminds me of just like a you know like an eyes wide shut party or something like you know um it, it's just got such great um um energy to it the orchestrations are gorgeous and it, it's fun seeing see you know i like to show the live orchestra sometimes playing it because you see the trombones and the horns are just they're vicious with those long um brassy notes so um uh, Dance of the Nights. The whole ballet is wonderful, beautiful music. I saw it once, and um, there was some controversy because he changed the ending. He changed Shakespeare's ending where it was a happy ending. But uh, uh, so uh, those those three pieces are probably his his best. The Love for Three Oranges, Peter and the Wolf, and um, Romeo and Juliet. Those that's wonderful music. He was such a monumental genius uh, in the 20th century that it's it's hard not to. Uh, mention his name uh, and and influence so many film composers. Uh, I mean, not just John Williams, but other people. Um, uh, and I remember reading this quote in college. I always thought it was really great. I actually didn't think it was attributed to him, but um, he said, there are still so many beautiful things to be said in C major. And that's a great line. C major, as we know, is kind of when you're learning music for the first time, you, you learn a C major scale. It's just a simple scale. And the key, many times, at least with me, when I'm trying to figure out something, I will start with C. It's just kind of the easiest. There's not any accidentals. So you just kind of... Um, so for a very sophisticated, genius, modern chess player, Russian, arrogant composer, uh, there's still many beautiful things to be said in C major, meaning that there's still tons of music out there. So we don't need a complex problem to go into we can just say something as beautiful and simple as c major there's still tons to discover in that uh, which is very enlightening for us artists and in fact i might write something after this in c major because uh he's not saying it's got to be c sharp minor and that's where all the music need to be written he's saying something as beautiful and simple as as c and then once you once you tackle the simplicity then you can get into to making it dissonant, making it interesting, making it, you know, um, evolve into different territories. But a lot of, a lot of still beautiful things in the key of C major in the simplest keys. So, um, hope you like Prokofiev, um, brilliant composer, love him. Um, and, uh, have a great rest of the day and I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>